Very, very pleased to have you all here for a very special night, uh, a conversation with artist Juan Sanchez, with Eve Lormoros Ortega, who's from R21. So looking forward to what Juan has to say. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Eve Lormoros Ortega. Uh, she is uh, interim executive director of R21 and executive producer of the R21, Art in the 21st Century television series. She has worked in film and television for over 15 years on documentaries and on independent feature films. Prior to her work on Art in the 21st Century, she worked on projects with Oscar-winning directors Deborah Dixon and Bill Fertig, as well as with MacArthur Fellow Yvonne Rayner, among many others. Uh, Eve is also the producer and director of Made in Thailand, a film that earned a nomination for Best Documentary Short from the International Documentary Association. So please join me in welcoming Eve and Juan. Thank you very much again. So thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks to Brick. Thanks to Juan. It's an honor to be in conversation with Juan. Um, I will provide a brief introduction. Um, Juan Sanchez is an influential American artist and one of the most important New Yorican cultural figures to emerge in the second half of the 20th century. Born and still based in Brooklyn, he has worked with a wide range of artistic media in a career that now spans 35 years. Sanchez earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the Cooper Union School of Art in 1977 and a Master of Fine Arts degree from the Mason Gross School of the Arts at Rutgers University. Since that time, he has become known as a politically committed artist who explores questions of ethnic, racial, and national identity in his work. Juan has had solo exhibitions at MoMA PS1, the Bronx Museum of the Arts, Exit Art, and other institutions. He has also taken part in numerous major group exhibitions throughout the United States, including at such institutions as MoMA, the Smithsonian, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. He is a recipient of grants and fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the Paula Krasner Foundation. Juan's works are in the permanent collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney, the Museum of Modern Art, and El Museo del Barrio, to name just a few. Professor of Art at Hunter College, he has also been a mentor to many artists at work in New York today. Welcome, Juan. Thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, I don't know how many of you know Art 21, but one of the things that we're always very interested in is how an artist chooses to become an artist. Um, you know, I, uh, Pepon Osorio, who I think was a colleague of yours, talked about growing up that being an artist really wasn't considered an option in his family. And I'm wondering for you, was it an option for you early on? How did you, how, how did you make that choice? And what were your early influences that led you to that, uh, to make art? Well, first of all, let me just uh, say thank you uh, for being here. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, having uh, a Q&A uh, with some of you. And I also would like to thank, uh, Elizabeth Farrell for uh, making this show happen and make everything else here uh, happen. <clears throat> and I, I feel very blessed and very happy, especially to have uh, this exhibition in, in good old Brooklyn, my native uh, soil. Uh, but like Pepongo Osorio, I don't know if I, I, I don't know if not having a choice is, is a way of saying it. Uh, um, but I know that since I was about four or five years old, I was so inclined to draw. Mm. And um, my parents used to throw these parties at, at the apartment and everybody was on the, on the floor slamming and dancing. And I was laid out on the floor on my stomach drawing. Mm. And um, um, what I was drawing, well, I had a thing for, for comic books and, uh, and also for uh, cartoon animations. 
So uh, that's what I was drawing. I was drawing uh, Superman, Batman, Popeye. I was competing with my classmates in uh, grade school who, who drew Superman better. And that kind of evolved uh, when I started going to, uh, to uh, high school, uh, the High School of Art and Design, then I thought being an artist was to be uh, an illustrator mm -hmm. and uh, uh, a, a commercial artist, uh, which was called at the time. And when I got admitted into Cooper Union and got exposed to the fine arts, I kind of defected from uh, commercial uh, graphic art to uh, the fine arts. And uh, at that point, uh, I, I, I grew kind of tired of, because uh, I did a little bit of freelance um, uh, paste ups on advertisements and, and, and the likes, and the fine arts really gave me uh, an aperture to, uh, to say whatever I want and not worry that there's someone over my shoulders, an art director, telling me how to uh, illustrate and to put things together for the benefit of selling a product. So I always wanted to be an artist, and I have evolved, and uh, I always felt that that was the one vehicle that I was best at doing. Uh, I'm not good in math, I'm not good in science. Uh, I was pretty good in, 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 uh, in history, in social history, and, and things like that, but uh, it, it just came natural. I just wanted to be an artist, regardless of whether I was aware whether or not it's something that you can make a, a living uh, with. Mm -hmm. And I know Leon Galoob was one of your mentors, a bit was that was that at Cooper or can you talk about this? Were you politi was uh, your art political from from the very beginning or when you said you moved to fine art you, you know at Cooper was it discovering different forms? Well, when I was in Cooper Union, uh, it was very um, I was very inclined to uh, try to figure out who I was and uh, what was my culture, what was my community. I was going through a whole identity uh, resurgence and really trying to define myself as, uh, as, as a Puerto Rican as well as, 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 a, as, a, as a black person. And um, when I entered Cooper Union, that was something that was even more prevailing. That was something that I was so, uh, so trying hard to, to express in, in my work. And uh, at that time, what do I know about Latino art? Practically uh, nothing. I certainly didn't know anything about uh, art uh, by African American artists or by any uh, uh, artists of, of, of color. Um, the usual suspect, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a Eurocentric uh, uh, curriculum where you knew and you learned about all of these artists, whether they're figurative or abstract or conceptualist or what have you. They intrigued me, they, they, I learned a lot from them and I was very involved with them. But it was an art history teacher, a Cuban uh, art history teacher by the name of uh, Melita del Villar, who pointed me to uh, El Museo del Barrio. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, uh, when I got to El Museo del Barrio, someone pointed me to uh, El Taller Boricua, which is a collective of, uh, of Puerto Rican artists. And at that point, that's when I began to see uh, examples of uh, contemporary art uh, from Puerto Rico and uh, created by uh, Puerto Ricans here mm -hmm. in, in New York. And, at that, and, and from there, it led me to the Studio Museum in Harlem, which at that time, it was in its very uh, beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our artists here, uh, Jorge Rodriguez, was one of the founding uh, members of that artist collective that started uh, the Studio Museum in Harlem. And, um, and, from, and, and, and then I, I had the opportunity to work with, with Hans Hacker. Um, and in graduate school, yes, Leon Gallup was someone who, who also had a great uh, influence and uh, he was my, uh, my mentor uh, after I, I graduated from uh, Rutgers University. We kept in touch and actually he kind of like started uh, my career. I mean, he recommended to a couple of young curators at the time to check out my work, and that's how I had my first group museum exhibition, which was at the Bronx Museum. Hmm. I didn't know you studied with Hans Huck. I wrote my college thesis on him. So is that, I mean, would you say that the, 
activist, um, activism in your work came from your life experience or from work? Those are two very political artists, Leon Golub and Hans Hacke. I mean, you know, do you think it came more from that kind of mentorship or just it, it from? Came, it came <coughs> from both because yeah. uh, uh, I was uh, very much uh, a political uh, activist. I was, and still am to a certain degree. I go in and out, but uh, at that time when I was a student, I was very involved with the campaign to, uh, to, to free five Puerto Rican nationalists that at that time has been in, in jail for 28 years or so. Um, um, Carter uh, gave them uh, a pardon and then I got involved with other uh, Puerto Rican political prisoners. From there, I started connecting to other uh, political prisoners in the United States, uh, Native American, African American, so on and so forth. Um, so my activism, which, which was part of my life and was also informing my work, was complemented with, uh, with uh, the works of, uh, of a Hans Hock, of a Leon Gallup, of a uh, Faith Rango, mm -hmm. uh, of a uh, Melvin Edwards, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and a whole uh, host of others that have given me some interesting models, uh, not only in terms of how to approach my work uh, formally, uh, within a political context, but also with uh, a number of the conceptualist artists like, uh, like a Hans Hacke, um, uh, um have really given me uh, some uh, clues as to bring that other element uh, in, into, uh, into the work. So with the combination of uh, photography and painting and drawing and text and so on and so forth, uh, I learned a lot from from many of these artists, how to semiotically uh, uh, assemble uh, these elements as a way of getting the viewer to connect to one thing that would lead to the other. So it's like taking them through uh, a mapping of elements. Uh, and you know, there are so many other artists, uh, surrealism, you know, uh, conceptualist art, you know, um, that I that I've learned and that I've seen in museums that has also been uh, informing my work as well. So I'm someone who likes all kinds of art. It's not mm -hmm. like I don't like this art because I am this type of an artist. Mm -hmm. I've always been open to everything and mm -hmm. I've absorbed everything. Mm -hmm. And even, even uh, to look at the work of a, of a Franz Klein mm -hmm. and get very excited about the gesture and the movement and, and the structure of his uh, uh, composition mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or a Motherwell, you mm -hmm. know. Um, or even uh, the collage works of a, of a Romar Bearden. Mm -hmm. uh, I've just been absorbing all of these things mm -hmm. and trying to find ways of how uh, their strategies and, and their aesthetic and the way they maneuver things find its way through my work. Mm -hmm. um, earlier, Juan took me through the exhibit and I, I was especially interested in what you were saying about ca Catholic iconography and there's a whole tradition of that in art and. I thought it was really interesting that <clears throat> as political as the work is, that you reference Malevich's uh, work, which is in kind of the opposite, you know, it's sort of almost pure spirituality. And um, I, I was curious about that. Um, I don't know if I, it's a tension, you know, because the, there, there is that coexistence of abstraction and very, you know, real stories in the work. And I'm just curious, Formally, how you think about that? Is it a conscious choice, or you know, if you can speak to the formal choices you make? Well, of course, I was uh, born and raised a Catholic, mm -hmm. and uh, I went through the whole religious uh, instructions and my first confirmation and communion. And uh, <coughs> I could say that uh, my parents were, especially my mother, were the type of practicing Catholics where they went to church during the holidays and would uh, send their children off to church every Sunday. And um, so it was me and my two brothers uh, that were going to church. And then after a while, we, uh, after spending the money that they gave us to give to the church on candy, we, we just stopped going to church, you know? And, uh, um, and uh, in my heart, um, you know, I, I believe in God and I, I do consider myself a, a Christian, but it's been 20 years since I identified myself as, as, a, as a Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing about the, the role of uh, the Vatican uh, through the whole history of uh, colonialism 
is that they definitely had a very powerful role and they had all the justification for, um, for the genocide that, that ensued uh, throughout the, Americans and the Americas and the Caribbean. And, uh, and they also played a very uh, strong role in, in terms of the justification of, uh, of slavery and so on and so forth. And so even though I embrace that part of it, on the other hand, I know, I know its role and I know, and I know the, the repercussion and the effects of that. And, uh, and uh, that plays, uh, that becomes a, a, a conversation, a discourse. Uh, it might work, you know. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a schizophrenic, uh, you know, relationship, putting in the yings and the yangs, um, but uh, at the same time, really contextualizing what was uh, and what continues to be uh, colonialism, and how uh, one of several institutions, uh, uh, like religion, played uh, a pivotal uh, role in that. So. So it's, it's schizophrenic, it's very much there. Um, it's all connected also to the roots of my, uh, of my uh, negritude and, mm -hmm. and, and my linkage to uh, uh, Taino and indigenous culture, not only within the Caribbean and the Americas, but throughout. Mm -hmm. um, and so that consciousness and that interconnection and, and the linkage to, uh, to Europe and, and, and Asia, uh, as well as, uh, as Africa and Latin America, uh, kind of like brought a, 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 another level of, of, of an international, uh, uh, an internationalist uh, identity. Mm -hmm. So uh, once I started finding and making those links, I became more and more uh, Puerto Rican, so to speak, but, um, but as a result of that, I became more uh, global. Right. And in that regard, um, at a certain point, that's when I started making connections with other peoples and, and other movements, not only because of uh, solidarity, but because I am uh, connected with them as well. Mm -hmm. So that, that actually leads me to my next question about cries and wounded whispers, because it is so international and <clears throat> I know we talked about you've been doing this series now for, for quite a while, and when you started it, did you start it conceiving, you know, a kind of canon of revolutionary figures, or did it emerge organically? And, you know, with e I, I sort of feel with each one, you're excavating and making a real powerful memorial to these people. Some are very well known to, like, Che Guevara, to many people, some less well known. And how do you, how do you, go about the process of choosing the stories and telling the stories, because, and, and then there are more from this series that aren't showing here, so, you know, and, and if you could sort of talk about, um, yeah, the trajectory of, of how that series grew. Well, oddly <clears throat> enough, oddly enough, it started with a painting that I did back in uh, 1999, which was, uh, which was, was a portrait of, uh, of my wife, uh, Alma. And uh, it ended up uh, at the PS1 exhibition. It literally arrived uh, uh, to the gallery uh, wet. I, I finished it a few days before uh, the art handlers came over to pick them up. And uh, that was a breakthrough to me. Um, that was a breakthrough because uh, uh, like most marriage and relationships, you have your good days and your bad days. And that was a, a painting that spoke about that, but, but more so about my, my, my love for her. And, um, and uh, within the composition, I used this element, which you saw at the opening of uh, this circle, which uh, if you cover one of your eyes, you will see the face of a crying child. And, um, um, I hate to embarrass her, but that happens to be uh, a photograph that I shot of my daughter when she was like weeks old. Um, and uh, I decided to create almost like a, like a Mandela where the face closed in uh, um, became, uh, was mirrored on the other side. And that was a cry that for me uh, would signify 
uh, a cry of angst, a, a, a cry of uh, vulnerability, anger, rebellion, depending on the context in which you, you would use it or how I would use it. And, um, and I, I use that as part of the painting. This is, uh, and, and literally, this is the child that, that, that we gave birth to, you know? Um, um, and for some reason, when I was looking at the painting uh, at the gallery, it dawned on me about this cry that people can hear and people not hear. And in some instances, if they were to hear that cry, it would be like distant. Um, and it, that's when, I, it, would, it was a breakthrough painting, that, that's what kind of like initiated the idea of creating a series of paintings, uh, uh, memorial paintings as, as such, of uh, the many individuals, like, like uh, Malcolm X or uh, Martin Luther King, uh, Pedro Aviso Campos, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, just hosts of others who, because of their advocacy uh, to change uh, the world, uh, have paid uh, with their lives. They were uh, tortured, assassinated, incarcerated, uh, rotting in jail, and so on and so forth. And, it also spoke to, to the reality that we still have people like that in jail. They're not all criminals. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, in jail that are criminalized because they go against the system. And uh, they're still in jail. They're political prisoners. So I decided to, to start in that series, and, and that's how it, it went about. And, and I, wanted, I wanted to use a post-mortem uh, photograph of uh, these individuals instead of the usual uh, heroic images of them leading a march or addressing a crowd or those beautiful epic uh, <coughs> portraits like the one most known about uh, on uh, Che Guevara. Um, I wanted to use images that really speak in a very direct way that these are individuals that were killed and if it meant showing uh, their dead corpse, uh, you know, on a table or on a body or in a in a coffin. That's what I wanted. That's 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 what I needed to do because we can romanticize these things. And mm -hmm. quite frankly, in all the years that I've been making uh, art, I uh, I I did understand at the time. Um, it's like it's like when you ask yourself, why am I doing this? But you still do it. Uh, there is a bit of uh, romanticism that played into a lot of my earlier work, and I wanted to cut through that a little bit more, and, uh, and people just react to it uh, as they should. Uh, that really magnified uh, the sacrifice of these people among those that we don't even know. Yeah, and I wanted to point out, because I didn't actually see this until Juan pointed it out, that um, those images of the dead body of the of the subject um, are abstracted in the background. And so you can actually, I don't know if it shows in the reproduction here, but afterwards, <laughs> everybody should go and look closely at these works because they really do um, reward close viewing. They're very layered. There's, there's a lot that's, um, you know, there, there are many different details that <clears throat> enrich your experience of the work and the story. But if you want to talk a little bit about the images that you used um, of Rosa Luxemburg, particularly. Well, with this particular image, uh, uh, I found this image of, uh, because Rosenberg was uh, attacked, beaten, uh, clubbed to death, and then thrown into the river. And then her body was uh, uh, found, it, it started floating about a week or two later. And so what they found was a bloated uh, body, a deformed body a body that has been uh, underwater, in the water for a long time. Um, a body that didn't look anything like her until they went through whatever to identify that it was her. Um, it's a very morbid image and uh, I was kind of like vacillating as to whether or not I should use that uh, as, as, an Im as, as an image that one would see immediately, like in the case of some of the other paintings um, and I decided to, uh, which is kind of sneaky in a way, I mean, in a way it's, it's uh, I felt that it was, it was much more effective, but what I did was I, uh, I, I took that, that photograph of her, of her head and I made uh, several uh, enlargements and, and, 
made Xerox and collaged them uh, onto the surface, uh, going different directions. So they do become even further uh, abstract, and it just becomes this interesting pattern that people will look at it and think it's just this interesting pattern, but when they close in on it, then they begin to see that it's her head. And, and, and then, you know, this, is, this was a, a, a feminist, uh, a labor uh, unionist, you know, uh, a Marxist, you know, who uh, was causing a lot of trouble. And uh, on top of that, she was also uh, a Jew, you know, so all the contempt that was, uh, you know, projected on her, you know, uh, the star of David, you know, played into, into, into that discourse and I found this beautiful portrait of her when she was about 14 years old and I felt that that was the, the one element right in the middle of, of the star that I felt was very effective and uh, would, would draw people in. Uh, the hands, um, which I shot in Photoshop, um, uh, hands, arms, body floating mm. in water, you know, so. Uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of what I try to do uh, with this painting, as well as all the other works, is to also uh, approach it. You know, there's, there's always the, the didactic element, but there's also the poetic uh, element that I try to, to, to bring into, into the work. I, I, I try very hard for the work to, to carry a lot of uh, metaphors and signifiers and get people to engage and ask and, and, and ponder and hopefully arrive to a place that is somewhat approximate to where I want to take them. Mm -hmm. I also was fascinated with <clears throat> the um, strange and bitter American history. I, I don't know if we can bring that slide up. Um, and, the, and the sources of those images that we were talking about earlier and um, I'd love for you to talk about those but sort of how that um, feeds into your process of source materials because it's, it's, a, it's a real mix of things you make and things you find in collage, but this was really Well, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the curator, but there was this incredible show that took place at the, at the Brooklyn um, uh, Museum. And um, it was an exhibition, oh God, I'm trying to remember the title, but it was a, a, an exhibition of uh, postcards that were uh, produce and use at the time of uh, the lynchings. You, we're talking about, uh, you know, the 30s, the 40s, uh, the without 20s. Sanctuary. Without sanctuary. And uh, the, the, the curator is a photographer. Uh, God, I'm trying to remember uh, her name, but the, the title of the show is Without Sanctuary. And that, that exhibition really uh, blew me away uh, in the worst way. I mean, to think that an industry would reproduce these images and sell them for people to, to buy and send it to their loved ones, uh, uh, having a good time in Mississippi or whatever, uh, was mind-boggling. Um, and uh, it took me a long time to digest that exhibition, and it probably took me about four years to even buy the accompanying uh, book catalog. But once I got my hands on the catalog and I, and I started looking through the images, that's where I felt compelled to do uh, a painting uh, about this. And of course, the collage of some of those uh, images are embedded within, within the cruiser form. Uh, uh, and, and I remember about uh, Billie Holiday's um, uh, song, you know, and um, and uh, music has always played uh, uh, a very strong role in my art as well. I'm always playing music uh, in my studio while I'm working. And if it's not jazz, it's uh, salsa, light jazz, um, folk music, uh, uh, whatever. But uh, uh, Bitter Fruit, you know, uh, was a very powerful uh, song. That, that left a strong impression, and I felt that the lyrics had to play uh, into uh, the painting. And a quotation uh, by uh, aboli abolitionist uh, John Brown was also incorporated in, into, into the piece. 
Um, and uh, the cry is there, and it's, in, and it's in red, you know, and it's a history that we have to constantly remind uh, society in the same way that we remind uh, people about the various uh, Holocaust that has taken place in this world, including here in, in, in North America with the Native Americans as well. Uh, I just felt um, uh, emotionally uh, compelled to, to address that and to find a way of doing it so that it is so layered and people have to really engage with the work and, 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 and get uh, the essence of, um, of, that, uh, of that horror, mm -hmm. uh, of that particular event, <clears throat> you know. The other thing also is that it's, 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 a, it's a topic that I feel still prevails today. We're not, we're not lynching uh, people, mm -hmm. but we're certainly shooting them mm -hmm. and killing them. And um, and creating um, more and more uh, penitentiaries to uh, to store them. Yeah. Um, well, actually, when we were talking about, I'm, I'm sorry, the the one that's your friend who died in the jail. Can we bring? What's the name of? Uh, para Angel de, de Vieques. Not too long ago, uh, there was just this this movement to get uh, rid of. Uh, the Marines from, from the fishing island of, uh, of Vieques. And uh, they were using uh, that island and the surrounding water and airspace for all kinds of military uh, uh, maneuvering and, and, and experimenting with different types of uh, bombing uh, procedures and so on and so forth. And um, that made life uh, of the people living in that island and trying to make a, a livinghood in that island, uh, very uh, difficult in addition to uh, the pollution and the, and the uh, contamination of, of the area. And uh, it's been a movement that has taken on uh, a lot of uh, strength, um, but in the earlier stage, it was just a few of us that would, you know, do demonstrations and protests, and there were, there were a, a, a group of people that thought of, uh, mobilizing individuals uh, to cross into uh, the military uh, base as a way of, uh, of, uh, of protest. He was one among a number uh, from that group that, that was uh, arrested. Um, um, Angel Cristobal, uh, Rodriguez, Rodriguez Cristobal, who uh, were arrested, they were given like a $500 fine <coughs> and about a six month uh, jail sentence. Um, but he was the only one that was isolated from, from, from that group and was taken to uh, Tallahassee uh, Penitentiary in, uh, in Florida. And uh, a couple of weeks or so before he uh, finished his uh, jail sentence, he was found uh, hung uh, in his cell. And um, he had uh, needle marks uh, throughout his arms. His whole body uh, was uh, battered. And, um, and it, it, it made it look like he was a, a drug addict uh, who, who uh, tortured himself and, and hung himself. Um, when I got the phone call uh, in November of 1979, it, it, it really blew me away. That, that was like my first semester in graduate school. And I got, and I got the phone call uh, telling me that, that he's dead. And um, of course, that, that was a shock because he was someone who I knew, he was a friend, who uh, would come from uh, Puerto Rico from time to time in our campaign. Uh, um, and uh, so, I, uh, you know, we, we befriended. And uh, so it, it was very personal. It was very right. personal. So I, I did a painting back in 1979. And then years later, I came up with this particular uh, piece. And um, just to um, remind people of uh, the sacrifices, we were able to get uh, the Marines out of the island, but we're, mm -hmm. we, we have inherited a contaminated uh, uh, island that the U.S. government hasn't yet begun to, to clean. Mm -hmm. But the thing about, about the Cries and, and Wounded Whisper paintings is that they are memorial paintings as such, uh, 
And when I started working on these, I couldn't help but remember seeing all these uh, memorial paintings that were uh, uh, just spurting out uh, in different parts of my neighborhood of uh, young men that were being shot in the street, you know, the drug war and all kinds of uh, violence. And then there's this memorial uh, mural that would uh, spring out. So that had uh, some, some uh, influence. But the paintings also uh, became, uh, went beyond just being a memorial. Uh, uh, um, they, they, they also speak to the fact that their spirit is still alive because of their impact during the time that they were alive and the stronger impact after, uh, after they were killed. So many of these paintings, um, um, they almost take on the look of, uh, of, a, of a shrine right. of sorts. Right. Um, and a lot of the uh, formal uh, compositional elements uh, has its derivatives uh, uh, from the kind of uh, altars that you would find so in churches and likes. That's a good segue because I want to make sure we talk about the works on paper and the videos. And um, the Para Neda Aga Sultan, if we can bring that one up. <clears throat> that one is uh, incredibly striking, very shrine like to this Iranian activist. And we were talking earlier about the relationship between um, the unknown barricos and the cries and whispers because one feels more personal, one feels more political, and yet there's obviously, I mean, that seems to be a, um, a thread throughout your work. But I also noticed that the, the form of the, um, what would you call it, like a mandala behind her, would you uh -huh. say, is, is echoed in your cries and whispers. And so if you can sort of talk about the, you know, the way in which the formal properties are shared between the two, even though they're, one is so much more personal. Well, uh, I think the piece, uh, 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 the work on paper, um, I don't know if it's more personal as, as perhaps a little bit more formal, but I do have uh, uh, a fascination and an attraction uh, to different kinds of uh, design. Uh, and uh, of course, Islamic design, um, which is so connected to my Moorish roots and all of that, uh, is, uh, is, is one of them. And um, this painting was realized uh, towards the end of the, of, 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 of the process, then the work on paper uh, surfaced. And uh, I felt that uh, that Islamic design within uh, uh, the circle, I thought was plenty and more than enough to just present that uh, as, as, as a piece. This one um, hit me uh, a little bit more personal because this was about a young woman who was shot by a sniper uh, in a demonstration that took place immediately after the election um, uh, in Iran where people hit the streets in protest because they felt that the, the whole election was rigged and the person who's been running the country all these years is again elected uh, president. And uh, friends invited her uh, to come to this demonstration. Uh, for the most part, the, these, uh, these, these were a group of young people who never went to a demonstration, but they thought it would have been cool. And there she was. And unfortunately, she, uh, she got killed. And uh, when that happened, almost immediately, that just went into, uh, into, the, into the social stream. I, I saw the video, which was shot by a number of people with their smartphones, where she just dropped on the floor and they came right close to her and she's bleeding and in a matter of seconds, uh, you know, she, she died. And that caused quite a, an impact to the point where she became the symbol mm -hmm. of uh, <clears throat> the, the green movement. Um, but uh, what struck me personally was the fact that uh, she was of the same age as that of my daughter. Mm. And, and that really blew me away. And uh, uh, there was a documentary that was done uh, about her about a year or two later uh, after the incident 
which uh, is a story about her, and she's just uh, a young woman. Uh, you go into her uh, bedroom, and uh, you see the usual uh, rock uh, posters uh, and everything else, and uh, it didn't look that much different from, uh, from my daughter. So when, when, when it first happened, it struck me, but what brought me to tears was the documentary. Hmm. And that's when I felt compelled to, to do this piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used a similar strategy as I did uh, with uh, the Rosa Luxemburg uh, mm -hmm. painting. Mm -hmm. uh, that image, uh, that photograph of her head with blood streaming throughout her, her ears and nose and mouth uh, was so awful and I decided to uh, make multiples collage it and, and somewhat seduce it with the green color. And then I found this, this beautiful portrait of her and that became part of this object made out of tiles. Um, and it became part of this uh, shrine. Mm -hmm. And the flower is, uh, you know, it's a flower that's upside down. The blood is rushing to the head. It's withering, it's losing its color, you know. And I could go on and on and on. I maybe not have left enough for your imagination, but uh, that's basically it. I, I want to get to the video because I also want to make sure there's time for Q&A. And so the videos are so different. Um, and I also was very interested in the way in which the works on paper came out of one of the videos. So, um, you know, t if you could talk about the Ana Mendieta video and, and the making of that and, you know, was that... Was that that was the first one, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And how was that, you know, as a progression from the work you'd done before? What was it like to move to video? Well, Adam Inieta was someone that I met when I was in graduate school. Mm -hmm. uh, she had her very first New York exhibition at the uh, AIR Gallery, which uh, was the very first women gallery space ever. And, um, and uh, Leon Gallup, uh, uh, told me about the show and invited me to come to the opening. And I met her uh, at the time, um, at the opening, and later that evening, he threw uh, a party for her at, at uh, his loft, along with his wife, uh, Nancy Spiro. And I was able to sit down with her for a little bit and, and, and chat with her. But I never, uh, I, I was very impressed with the work and I really wanted to know her, but as openings goes, uh, you could only say hello to somebody and not kind of like bogart and, you know, monopolize. Uh, so uh, I said hello and I moved along and, and uh, I didn't really get to really meet her and connect with her until 1982. I met her briefly in 1980, 1980 or oh, 79, 1982, I was in a group show and uh, uh, another mentor, um, who, who I had at, at Rutgers University, Melvin Edwards, introduced me to her. And she was looking at, uh, at, at some of the paintings that was on the wall, and she pointed to a couple of those paintings, uh, and she was telling us, boy, these paintings, I like these paintings. Do you know who's the artist? And of course I said, it was me. <laughs> and um, uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a number of Taino symbolism that was embedded into, into the work, and she started pointing to those things and talking about her work mm -hmm. and how it's connected to what she's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and from that point on, it's been uh, a few years of, of meetings and get-togethers and visiting her studio and looking at what she's doing and, and just having this, this discourse about art, politics, and, and our indigenous uh, African uh, roots. Of course, she died tragically, um, um, but uh, years after that, I felt, because I always thought of her, because uh, our exchange uh, really had an impact, uh, I come to realize that she was someone else who also uh, mentored me, you know. She was maybe about seven years older than me. Um, I felt compelled to, to do a video uh, in homage uh, to her, and it was the first time that I that I that I've done a video. Uh, but this is someone who took uh, video classes in uh, in undergraduate and graduate school, 
and was always frustrated because there's never enough equipment and the equipment was always broken down and you always produce something that you thought was crap. And, and so, so from that point on, it, uh, while I was doing my paintings and my prints and my photography, I was also a frustrated filmmaker. So when the opportunity came to, to do a video piece, that's the first thing I wanted to do, uh, uh, a dialogue uh, with Ana Mendieta. And uh, of course, that entailed a whole different sensibility and a whole different temperament to, uh, to my own work. But since I'm also uh, a person who likes film and is always looking into the movies and never get off the TCM uh, channel, uh, um, I felt that uh, with what little I, I took in courses that I had something to, to give it a try. Mm -hmm. um, the, other, the other video is directly linked um, to, to the works on paper because I had to do a large body of collages um, and the collages was made up of uh, these photographs of a male or of a female whose face is covered by the Puerto Rican flag, and they became, you know, signifiers. They, they symbolized to me uh, the, the Puerto Rican population. They signified uh, a, a nation. They, they signified a colonized uh, nation. They also uh, signify uh, political prisoners. And, uh, and I made those collages, which was then scanned and incorporated into the video. Uh, when the video was done, I ended up with piles and piles of these uh, collages. And at that point, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with these collages. And that's where this series came from. So the works on paper derived from uh, the video. Uh, interestingly enough, the collages and all the other elements incorporated into the videos are uh, still images. <clears throat> um, the pace, the movement uh, was definitely that of a collage. but it was also influenced by my research in terms of how uh, people use uh, various uh, brainwashing technique. Ah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, think, I think the most typical example would be that of the film, uh, The Maturian uh, Candidate, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and these flashes of white lights in between mm -hmm. to program people. And I was looking at that, and I say, I think I'm gonna use that technique, except I'm not gonna use white light. <laughs> And, and, and the flashes of the images, the images are, are, are barely uh, split seconds, but what's interesting is that we absorb so much information and we store it into our uh, memory bank. And so even if it's just something that we barely see, we see it and you see images and you don't see images. On a second and third look, you see images that you haven't seen the first or the second time. And it's a way of awakening one's consciousness in terms of all the history, all the images that we keep absorbing on a day-to-day -day basis. And it brings to the surface uh, uh, w where these images come from. It brings to the surface the many uh, events that, that we have seen or learned uh, through, uh, through history. And for me, uh, because this title, uh, uh, Unknown Boricua uh, Streaming, I'm the unknown Boricua who's uh, going through a stream of uh, consciousness. The video took uh, a life of its own because I kept adding more and more images and more individuals, uh, famous historical figures, those that are not so historical, and portraits of my mother and my daughter and, 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 and a friend and cartoon characters. And it just talks about this whole trans cultural uh, <clears throat> accumulation of, um, of my life. And uh, the video could end up two hours, but I had to cut it down to six minutes. It's only a fragment of what's been my, my psychological and, and emotional uh, uh, experience. I'm gonna ask one last question before we open it up if there's time. I just wondered, um, you know, we interviewed uh, Tanya Bergera last season in Art 21, and um, she talks so much about art being useful and the role of socially engaged art. And I wonder what your thoughts are about what art should do and, you know, 
Yeah, what, 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 do you, what are your goals, do you, or do, do you have goals? Do you think art should have that responsibility? I think, I think, I think it should, although I really believe that uh, there's so many different kinds of arts that, 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 that's happening, which, which has its uh, rightful place, you know. And, um, you know, but when I made the decision to make the kind of work that I did, uh, I made that decision because I felt that I had a, a, a responsibility. I kind of felt that the work would play some role in having impact and, and, in, and, and in contributing to, to causes and, and, and movements, you know. And, um, and I do believe that art can play that role. And in the case of this particular artist who, whose work is perhaps a bit more interactive, it's a whole different approach. I think those 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 kinds of uh, intervention uh, through art, uh, um, as well as what I'm doing, is uh, very important. But I have to also say that there's a lot of art out there that you know maybe they don't want to make a political statement or whatever. It's purely formal and theoretical or whatever, and I learn a lot from that, you know. Mm -hmm. I think we need a bit of, of, of all of that, but I do uh, uh, champion people who are doing the kind of work that I'm doing in whatever form, and I'm also talking about musicians and poets and people who do street theater and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's activist art, but it's, but it's art. It sensitizes us to the wonderful and the awful things that we are uh, experience uh, in this fallen planet, and um, and it's necessary. And uh, and to see a beautiful still life is necessary too. It reminds us of what we're fighting for. Hmm. Um, um, I think the only issue that I have is how the markability or the commodification of art, in a way, has. Um, contaminated mm -hmm. uh, what's the real function of art. And so you have uh, people who they're very caught up about, about that and really compromises the very integrity of what art should be about, whether it's political or not. You mm -hmm. know? At the same time, I feel that all art is political. Uh, uh, I, want, I remember visiting Nicaragua back in 1985 and there was hundreds and hundreds of portraits of Sandino, uh, but there was also hundreds and hundreds of landscapes, still life, and other types of, of paintings. And it was interesting to hear artists talk about how they were repressed for making that kind of art. Um, uh, so in a, in, a, in a society, totalitarian and repressive, whatever, in certain parts of the world, just, just the fact that you're painting an abstraction, you know, you could be uh, persecuted, you know, mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And that really uh, opened my mind and really made me think about art in the most pluralistic uh, way mm -hmm. and how everything uh, that, that's manifesting through art is so essentially necessary. I think the issue is, for people to make those connections, to have that kind of cons uh, consciousness, rather than keeping it all decompartmentalized and believing that there's no real inter interaction. And of course, the market, and to a large extent, uh, the media uh, perpetuates that. Mm -hmm. I remember when I, was, when I was trying to, you know, get my work shown and things like that, I would go to whatever gallery I thought was interesting for me to show, and um, and the first thing they would tell me is we're not a Puerto Rican gallery, or so they'll direct me to El Museo del Barrio or any other place where they show, you know, <clears throat> Puerto Rican Latino art, you know, and um, and that infuriated me because uh, yes, I'm 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 a Puerto Rican artist, but I'm also a, an artist. I'm also a human being, and you you know. You're just looking at the surface. I mean, the work deals with so many human, um, you know, qualities. Um, I've had uh, people come to me, uh, be that Irish or Jewish or Italian or or whatever, 
and point to one of the portraits I've done of my mother and say, that's my mother, that's my grandmother, so on and so forth, you know. Um, and then there's the stereotype where, you know, art historians, and many of them who don't even, not interested in, in Puerto Rican art, you know, um, uh, um, now there's an interest toward Latin American art, but, you know, um, it, you know, if it's South America, it's Mexico, and then Cuba, and then everything else is inconsequential. But, but um, you know, for them to say there's no abstract art in Puerto Rico is ridiculous. You didn't look. There's a tradition of that. You know, there's a tradition of uh, conceptual art. You are a product of not only of what's been going on there, but more so what's been going on here, which I could also stake claim, you know. And, um, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a serious uh, problem. I, I feel that, okay, you're black, so why aren't you talking about this and talking about that, you know, rather than, you know, whatever you do, have a conviction and integrity and, and do it well and be in a position to also uh, engage in conversation and to teach people. When I teach, I don't teach them about political art. I teach them how to draw, I teach them about color, design, composition. I give them some theoretical, conceptual uh, ideas for them to work on so that if they wanna move on and just paint brick buildings, then so be it. Of course, we have Martin Juan, right, and Martin Juan has taken the brick buildings or the brick walls beyond an incredible uh, point, you know? But the point of the matter is that I'm, I'm here to give them all of the tools that I may have so that they could move on and become the free artist that they want to become. And whether that person is Latino or white or Asian or whatever, where you wanna go with your art and how you wanna do it is perfectly fine as long as there's an integrity and that you don't sell out. You know. Thank you. So I'll say thank, thank you, Juan. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Brick. Thank you all for coming.